All right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar with Daniel Freeman. We're going to be talking about the value of sport in the US, and I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation um, about some some really interesting insights um, that, that that Daniel has not only experienced but been been uh, deep in, in in the research. So before we get started, I just wanted to, to to kick off and just mention that we do have a number of webinars. Um, posted on the the, um, the Drexel website, um, we've got all kinds of ranging topics from you know the the the, the, the gender and social justice um, challenges that we're facing in sport through to you know some real fundamentals of of, of, of coaching and, and what sports about. Um, and and I'm, I'm I know that the the content uh, today that that Daniel's going to talk about connects with one of the programs we've got coming up later in the spring um, that talks about how are we developing. Um, leadership with with our athlete base, um, and so that'll be a that's going to be a one day workshop that we'll, we'll do in April. Um, we've also uh, got a couple of webinars coming up later l l later in the next couple in the next couple of weeks. One looking at um, the political landscape and how to how to how to uh, improve the culture in your clubs. That's with the USOPC's club management uh, program coming up uh, on Thursday, and then. Uh, on the 9th of March, we're we're doing a webinar looking at sports specialization, and then. Um, connecting with with Daniel's talk today um, on the 30th of March, looking at the impact on youth sport um, and a discussion about the difference that sport makes. So um, our our EDD program deadline comes up in in a week, and and we're actually shifting our uh, EDD program to a sport leadership concentration. So um, there's there's a lot more information on the Drexel website with that. Um, but yeah, wanted to welcome you today, Daniel, and and, and to this conversation about um, you know where we're at with sport, um, how sport is a, a, a is a vehicle for change in society, but um, but 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 what are some of the barriers and what are some of the opportunities with regard to youth sport um, as we as we look at um, you know what's happening what's happening for college athletes, um, you know the debate about um, how college athletes are being taken care of payment um so so i just wanted to welcome you and, and hand it over to you so welcome thank you cameron i will share my screen okay and let's go here Let's move this over here. There we go. Okay, does everyone see that? We look good? Okay, so let's start. Uh, so first, I, I want to thank Cameron and the uh, Drexel Master in Sport Coaching Leadership Program. And I am really excited to see that the Doctor of Education program is going to have their concentration in sport leadership now as well. I think that's great. And thank you to everyone that is attending. So first, I want to talk about myself. I think that's always important to give you a background of who I am before I start speaking. I love to cook. It's an outlet for my creativity. I am the school record holder in the Javelin at my university, UNC Charlotte in North Carolina. I have coached collegiate track and field, and I've been a USAW, USA weightlifting certified weightlifting coach. I had the opportunity to run, a, run an FBS division one marketing department in my first job in college athletics. I did that for a few months when my colleagues ended up leaving. Currently, I'm the Associate Director of Development for Drexel University's Business, Entrepreneurship, and Professional Studies schools. I've written and published my first book last year, The Athletic Giving Handbook. And my dream someday is to be a president or a chancellor of a Division I university. These are some pictures. Uh, my wife and I getting married in Asheville this past year, me competing internationally the first time I did that and our glorious dog Woodson, because uh, everyone loves a dog picture, who doesn't? So let's talk about today what we're going to cover. And we're going to talk about how sports can empower the development of our future generations. 
insight on the debate over college athletes being paid to play, and it is much deeper than it seems. And then the power to create societal change can be seen as a benefit or a detriment. We're gonna look at racial injustices in college athletics and specifically in the WNBA, because there are some great examples. So we're gonna talk about amateur sports, college sports, semi-professional and professional. There's gonna be a mix of everything in our presentation. Things to remember, I want you to formulate your own opinion. Take in the information I am providing, build your opinion. After each section, formulate how each of these topics could impact different parts of society. And we may discuss at the end of each section. Also, don't discredit information just because you don't understand it. I find that's always something really important to make sure that I reiterate. If there's something you don't like or don't understand, take a step back, take a minute, view the information from another lens, not from your own, because the way to continue improving our sport and leadership in general is to try to look at situations from another lens, not your own. And then the last thing is push yourself to a higher level of thinking. Let's jump right in. Okay, the number that you see on here, that is $17 billion. And if we have any friends here uh, from other countries, that is just over 14 billion euro. That is the revenue from youth sports. Now, it's really interesting to think about this because a really great statistic here is that the kids sports industry is nearly $17 billion, which is larger than professional baseball and about the same size as the National Football League. So take that in and think about that for a second. The same, um, the size of the industry for youth sports is the same as it is for the NFL where we play, where we pay grown men large sums of money. It's, and that's really interesting to me and it was kind of tough to understand that the first time that I read that. So let's talk about this more than just the surface of the cost. I wanna ask you a question. If you played sports during your childhood, can you estimate how much it cost your parents or guardians for you to play? Just think about that for a second. And imagine from the time you started, whether it was six years old, eight years old, up till the time that, let's say about 16 or so, can you imagine how much money, looking back, your parents or guardians may have paid for you to actually play those sports? And another piece while you're thinking about that, among richer families, youth sports participation is actually rising, while among the poorest households, it's trending down. And you can see on the slide, the share of children ages six to 12 who played a team sport on a regular basis declined by about 4% in 2017, according to the Aspen Institute. But another statistic with that, that may help you understand that, just 34% of children from families earning less than $25,000 a year played a team sport at least one day in 2017 versus double that percent for homes earning more than $100,000 a year in their household. And in 2011, six years prior, those numbers were 42% and 66% respectively. So just think about that. You can automatically see from these statistics just at the start that less money in a household income means that the children have less opportunity to grow in the realm of sports. And if you're watching this, you may or may not know that sports is an incredible tool to help socialize children. So I also wanna talk about some European alternatives. We've seen what it's like from me just talking to you about the statistics in the US. Now here's another system that's doing it really well in Norway. <clears throat> Their youth sport policies are deliberately egalitarian. Norwegian leagues value participation over competition so much that clubs with athletes below the age of 13 cannot even publish game scores. Now that's very contrary to, you think of the Little League World Series <laughs> that is nationally televised <clears throat> with some kids that look like grown men and their scores are televised. People are probably betting on it somewhere. And it's just very interesting to look at that. And another piece 
is there is a national lottery in Norway <clears throat> and it's run by a government owned company called Norsk Tipping, spending most of its profit, Norsk Tipping, on national sports and it funnels hundreds of millions of dollars to youth athletic clubs every year. What does that mean? That means that parents aren't paying for their kids. That means that those families making 25,000 or less and the families making over 100,000 or more, there may not be that big of a difference there because they don't have to fund the opportunity to compete. Now, what is Norway doing? Norway is an athletic juggernaut. In the last Winter Olympics, the country won 39 medals, most of any country in the history of the games and nearly twice as many as the United States. And it's doing that with a population smaller than the state of Minnesota. <clears throat> now, another good example is France. Oh, let me go back. France. So they have a program called Sport de la Vie. It uses sport as a tool for social inclusion, like I mentioned before, serving disadvantaged kids through sport. They have 40 centers in some of the most deprived neighborhoods in 22 French cities. And they have enrolled 6,500 children in their personal and professional development programs, not just sport, because sport is larger than the sport itself. So let's talk about youth and let's talk about overuse injuries. You, young athletes are more susceptible to overuse injuries just because their bodies are still developing. They're growing. Their muscles and tendons are stronger than their bones. And this leads to overuse injuries to the growth plates and chronic pain. Now, the reason we're talking about this is because there is a deeper meaning <clears throat> to this. It's not just about overuse injuries. I want you to think about if these injuries occur, are there local and equitable healthcare providers available to help these kids come back from their injuries? Are these families making less than 25,000 a year? Do they have the ability for these kids to rehabilitate themselves and get back to their sport? Or is this something that is going back into their life and they're seeing as an opportunity or as a lack of an opportunity because they don't have the resources. So they're losing out on this piece of their life that can help them grow socially. So that's really an interesting one. If the family doesn't have the ability or the means to care and rehabilitate the child, what happens to the child's quality of life? You can see some examples here. Baseball and softball, repetitive throwing can cause elbow and shoulder injuries. Tommy John surgery, I know all too well because I've had it myself. Hockey, having worked as a strength coach for a number of years, the mechanics of skating stride can cause hip problems. I've seen that many times with young kids. And then gymnastics, wrist and elbow injuries are common for tumbling and twisting. And we know that that is true because the average age of gymnasts is 16 to sometimes 18 years old or younger. You don't have older gymnasts because those men and women are hurt and they can't come back from the injuries that they have. <clears throat> So let's go on to college sports. Now, if you're on this, you may know a little bit about sports. I have some great descriptions here and I can share this PowerPoint so that people can see it afterwards. I can share this with Cameron or well, there's a recording of this so you'll be able to look back. We all know division one is the highest division. That is the standard for the most competitive athletes coming into college. They want to go division one. They want the best competition. That is where most, not all, of the athletes who go to the professional league for their sport come out of. Again, not always. Division two, you can see there's a little bit of a difference. In division two, there's a balance. Athletes are recognized for their academic success, their athletic contributions, and their campus and community involvement. That is at the heart of the Division II philosophy, essentially the second tier for college athletes. Then you come to Division Three, which is a little bit different. 
It's unique. Division three does not award athletic scholarships due to their unwavering commitment to academic success of every student athlete. They look at it as the opportunity to play sports in college is a privilege, but we often forget that it's also a choice. When high school seniors decide to be division three athletes, they're illustrating their passion for their sport and a pursuit of education. Now, this is what I really wanna talk about. <clears throat> Some people know what the NAIA is. As you can see here, the NAIA is a great funnel for athletes who may not have the grades to go to division one, two, and potentially three. It's a great funnel. Their broader focus is developing athletes to their full potential and helping them reach their overarching goals. Now, what is interesting is I'm gonna show you some others you may not know about. The NJCAA, the National Junior College Athletic Association. It is a great route for athletes to improve their skills, gain playing experience and work on their academics in a college setting. <clears throat> Similar to the NAIA, but it governs community, state, and junior college athletics. Now, I wanna to come to the two that very few people know about, the NWAC. It's an association of 32 community colleges located in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and British Columbia. The difference between the NWAC and some of the other conferences we've spoken about, or athletic associations, they only sponsor seven men's sports and eight women's sports. And specifically, their recruiting is only confined to 10 states. And you can see them there, I won't read them out. And then you have a very large body, the CCCAA, which is located in California, and it is an association of 108 community colleges. <clears throat> and they host 12 men's sports and 12 women's. And unlike the NWAC, exceptions can be made, but the majority of their student athletes are recruited in and around California. Now, the reason I'm explaining this is because it's all about opportunity, especially what we're talking about today. There need to be places for potential student athletes to go to for them to grow and build and create and become a part of society. Now, we've talked about colleges, let's go into the hot topic that most people are talking about and most people know about, name image likeness, for short, NIL. Congressional bills are being created that would allow collegiate student athletes to make money of their own name image likeness. So when you see NIL, what that means is there is a blossoming area of student athletes, mostly the student athletes that are on the higher competitive side, the ones that are on TV often, they want to make money off of their name, image, and likeness while in college. And the NCAA sees this as a threat because once they pay them for their name, image, and likeness, or they make money off of that, they are not amateurs anymore. <clears throat> and the thought is they believe that if that happens, people will not see education as a tool and they won't go compete for the NCAA. Now, you can see here, I have some notes. Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut he says that we can no longer depend on the NCAA to effectively protect, and here's the important piece, the health and safety or financial well-being of athletes. The fact is college athletes have fueled a $14 billion industry with blood, sweat, and tears. Now, going past that, what would the bill do? The bill aims to have the federal government provide a broader overhaul of how schools share their revenue with college athletes. The bill would also help create a United States president appointed committee commission to enforce a wide variety of rules, including 
more clearly defined health and safety standards, athlete-friendly transfer rules, a name, image, and likeness market with minimal restrictions, and a revenue sharing spot for sports that rake in the large sums of money. And we know, and if you don't, I'll tell you right now, the revenue generating sports are football, men's basketball, women's basketball, and sometimes baseball. <clears throat> and you can see here some of the other bills on the table, the College Athlete Bill of Rights, College Athlete and Compensation Rights Act, and the Student Athlete Level Playing Field Act. Now, something to understand as well is that we talked about Division II being Tier Two, but Division II already has something in the works. There's actually a document in, process, in progress addressing this matter, which states that a student athlete may use his or her name, image, and likeness in any non-athletic endeavor in promoting or endorsing commercial products. So that's an interesting piece to think about there. They can use their NIL in any non-athletic endeavor. Again, this has not passed yet. This is just a document that's been cir circulating that is trying to be pushed through. So I wanted to put up some pieces so that you could physically see. Now you can look at the first one, the annual per athlete licensing value. You can see a softball athlete from Oregon, that'd be $1,000 a year. And these have formulas on how they would determine that. And we'll kind of go through that a little bit. You can see Trevor Lawrence at Clemson. A lot of people know his name, $10,000 a year. This is licensing. And then you can see Deshaun Watson and LeBron James and where their numbers lie in comparison. Now let's go over to the most valuable college athletes. That's an important one to look at. When you look at this top 15 list, there are one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's almost 50% of the most valuable college athletes are from non revenue generating sports. And you see a lot of athletes from gymnastics. You see Haley Cruz from Oregon softball, who's in that, uh, the diagram or the, the photo before this, the softball player from Oregon. <clears throat> And what's interesting as well is you look at this and you can see their endorsement potential. A lot of this is based off of their social media following, interactions, the amount of time that they are seen on national television. There are formulas that go into creating, uh, for the research, creating these models to show how much they could potentially receive from endorsements. And it's incredible to look at this because we talk about the revenue generating sports being football, men's basketball, women's basketball, baseball. There are no baseball players on this. And if you look on here, you really only have two football players on this. Again, this is, uh, this is a year or two old now, as you can see with Justin Fields and Jake Fromm. We know Jake Fromm is in the NFL right now. But you can see how many men's basketball players and women's basketball players that are on this. And then Madison Kachin, who was an Olympian. You can see each of these different pieces and Kyla Ross as well, an Olympian. And the last piece on this slide is the estimated yearly endorsement revenue. You can see Joe Burrow, and they're basing this off of his followers on Instagram. He has almost 900,000 followers and they believe his estimated yearly endorsement revenue through Instagram could be $700,000. And then you look at Tua and Jalen Hurts. This is just to give you an example of how much money research shows that they may be losing and not getting. And I think we can say by looking at this, I believe that we can say for four years at LSU, it does not cost $700,000. So he would be able to make a profit off of that, even if he was paying for school and he was receiving estimated his estimated yearly endorsement revenue. It's something important to think about. Remember, I talked about looking at these things from a different lens. We all have different opinions, 
but it's important to look at this and look at the facts. So let's also talk about COVID impact. We're talking about college athletics. COVID has had a huge impact. It has exceptionally limited crowds or made them non-existent. There have been fewer games due to COVID protocols. There are no guaranteed money games because a lot of conferences have decided to stay within themselves. There, have been, there has been less philanthropic support. Now, what happens with a combination of those factors? It is costing universities tens of millions of dollars in upending the underlying business model of college sports. Universities across the country have already responded by ending many low revenue sports. Low revenue sports are normally called Olympic sports. This has led to widespread lamentations about the decreased opportunities for intercollegiate athletes who play sports. Now, from 2006 to 2016, the Power Five athletic departments saw their revenue nearly double in that decade, rising from three and a half billion to $6.7 billion in revenue. Now you may ask, what is a Power Five institution? They are comprised of institutions that mainly, not always, but mainly operate financially in the black. They take in more revenue than expenses and they end the year with a profit. Now these places mainly rely on the large money-making machine of college football. Their main source of revenue is college football tickets, media rights deals, and philanthropic donations that are tied to access to prime spots at these sporting events and to the marketable student athletes. When they cannot play a full college football season, a lot of their sources of revenue don't dry up fully, but they shrink a lot. When their main source of revenue begins to dry up, the institutions have begun to drop their Olympic sports because they mainly operate in the red. Those Olympic sports normally spend more than they bring in. Not always, but that is the case normally. Now, what happens when you drop Olympic sports? Student athletes lose opportunities. Now, annual revenue shortages upwards of $50 million for some of these power five institutions. They are budget gaps too large to be solved by belt tightening alone. Several power five schools, including Stanford, Iowa, and Minnesota have already taken action. And according to ESPN, 352 NCAA sports programs have been cut since March, 2020. That is across all divisions. Closer examinations show that many athletic departments were already financially stressed, even before the effects from the pandemic. Pre-existing structural problems in the broader economic system of college sports created financial challenges for many schools, and they're being amplified by COVID-19. We're talking about building up the generations, creating opportunity for these student athletes, and finding ways to better systems and create, like I said, more opportunities, these droppings of sports is not helping that. It's hindering that. This economic system has encouraged FBS athletic departments spending to rise in unsustainable and imbalanced ways, creating the financial overextensions that is putting these schools at the risk to cut sports and creating more damage than we've seen. So why big changes now? Is, is it opportunistic? Is it a time to use COVID as an excuse? You know, why do athletic programs continue to spend and not save? Sports are cut because schools decide there isn't enough money on a relative basis to sustain their current portfolio of teams. This is the rationale behind most sports cuts at the FBS level. In these cases, 
athletic departments could rearrange their budgets to retain all of its teams, but doing so would require a level of frugality deemed unacceptable to compete with their competitors in terms of resources. In other words, Iowa, Stanford, and Minnesota could internally rearrange their $120 million budgets and fund more teams modestly as revenue recovers, but someone's gonna lose out. And their big revenue generator is college football and college basketball. Now, something also to understand is the nonprofit structure of athletic departments. It encourages increased spending. As is the case with most nonprofits, athletic departments spend basically all of the revenue they earn each year, it's important to understand that, on their mission-focused work. Every school, every athletic department has a mission, they have values, they have a statement that they are working towards with that revenue that they're bringing in to help execute. Unlike in private businesses or professional sports, there are no owners with an incentive to retain excess income for profits or future needs. Now, we're gonna get a little bit deeper on this one. We're gonna talk about racial injustice in college athletics. How can I state the simplistic version for the root of racial injustice? NCAA football and men's basketball generate most of the revenue that underwrites athletic departments and pays for coaches multi-million dollar salaries. These two sports in particular are dependent on many black players and the physical punishment of black bodies. And while these athletes produce billions of dollars in wealth, they not only don't receive any income, but also have no collective bargaining rights they have no long-term medical care, a guaranteed scholarship, or even a seat at the table to discuss these issues. Now, we all know that there is the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, and we know that the NCAA is working on taking the student athlete's voice, but it's really tough to be one student athlete sitting at a table with a bunch of adults when there's a lot of money on the line to sustain different areas. So what are the numbers backing up this inequity? The National Bureau of Economic Research has an indictment of the current case system. Through forensic investigation, it found that the revenue from athletic departments has nearly doubled from 4.4 billion to 8.5 billion over the last 14 years. Earlier, we talked about 10 years. 60% of that growth is due entirely to the two sports I mentioned earlier, football and men's basketball. Football staffs have seen their salaries double as have non-coaching administration jobs in these athletic departments. Now we talked about having a voice and we talked about the change in, in how student athletes can and, and athletes in general can affect change in our society. A great <clears throat> example in conjunction with this quote from David Ridpath, the past president of the Drake Group, nobody has more power than the athlete. Kylan Hill, a nationally ranked running back from Mississippi State University's football team, seemed to provide a final push for state lawmakers to change the state flag, which, is, which was the last in the nation to retain the Confederate battle emblem. His tweet on June 22nd, was either change the flag or I won't be representing this state anymore. He is a Mississippi native and he said, I'm tired. That's a big statement for a well-known athlete in the state of Mississippi. And his teammates largely, largely backed him as well as other athletes, coaches and administrators. And days earlier, the NCAA conference had amplified the call for the flag change by announcing that they would not hold championship events in Mississippi, putting more pressure on lawmakers to make that change. Then Walmart announced it would stop displaying the flag in its stores. You see all of this started 
from the NCAA. And then Kylan made that push. Just a week after he reached out, Governor Tate Reeves signed a quick legislation approved by lawmakers to remove the flag that had flown over Mississippi for 126 years. One common thing is the players use their voice in threatening to withhold their labor. Players are moving towards zero tolerance for racial injustice, and that's to be applauded. They're over the failures of society, and they're using their platforms to take a stand. There's a lot they can do in their circles, and they have a large platform with a lot of power. That's from Ramogi Huma, the executive director of the National College Players Association. <clears throat> so we talked about racial injustice. Now let's talk about sexism. What is Title IX? A lot, many people have heard of Title IX and it just doesn't, it's not only for college athletics, which is how a lot of people understand it to be. Title IX gives women and women's athletes the right to equal opportunity in sport and educational institutions that receive federal funds from elementary schools to colleges and universities. So let's read that again. It provides the right for equal opportunity for women from elementary schools to colleges and universities. And it requires that every educational institution have a Title IX compliance coordinator. That is how one way for them to stay compliant. Now you can see there are three other ways <clears throat> to stay compliant. Effective accommodation of student interests and abilities, athletic financial assistance, and program compliance, the laundry list of benefits to and the treatment of athletes. Also, an institution is not required to offer an equal number of sports for each sex. That is one thing that people tend to get confused. However, an institution must accommodate to the same degree the athletic interests and abilities of each sex in the selection of sport. A great example is that when a university adds a football team, they normally are adding at least 100 male athletes to their athletic department. Now, if you already did not have <clears throat> enough women's athletes in your athletic department to make sure that there was an equal number of women's athletes and men's athletes, then the institution will be given a certain period of time to add women's sports to make it equal. It's not about an equal number of sports. It's about an equal number of participants. So let's also talk about the United States Department of Education for Civil Rights is the primary agency charged with enforcement of those issues. Individuals who have been harmed by the failure of an institution to comply have an individual right to sue under the law. And almost 95% of such lawsuits are having to do with athletic program violations and they have been successful. You can actually see right now online that Stanford is going through that right now. And I wanna make a mention, we talked about the laundry list. That was number three on three ways to stay in compliance with Title IX. The laundry list includes equipment and supplies, scheduling of games and practice times, travel and daily per diem allowance, access to tutoring, coaching, locker rooms, practice, competitive facilities, medical and training facilities and services, publicity, and recruitment of student athletes and sports services. If you're gonna give one team of men $100 per day for daily per diem, you better make sure that you're giving that women's team the same thing, that is equitable. Okay, so. Let's move on to semi-professional sports. Let's take a look at this. We have uh, two focuses really on here, the NBA G League, and we'll talk about why that's important. It's the level of play between college basketball and the NBA. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about minor league baseball, single A, double A, and triple A. It's the three levels leading up to major league baseball. So let's talk about minor league baseball. Minor League Baseball is a feeder system. When Major League Baseball needs more bodies, 
or they want someone specific, they can drop someone from their team, put them down in the minor leagues and pick up a fresh athlete. There are 240 minor league teams across the nation. That is a large system. And it's also one of the most efficient uses of money in family entertainment in small towns. Now, minor league baseball is going through a sort of reckoning. What are they facing in 2021? <clears throat> the MLB demanded that applicants sign a 10 year professional development license with a non-disclosure agreement in NDA and a promise to not sue the MLB. And you'll start to understand where that goes. Teams were required to sign a new marketing and sponsorship agreement, which Baseball America describes as giving up local revenue they can count on for speculative revenue that may or may not arrive. And you need to remember that these 240 minor league teams, some sustain cities and towns across the country. They're an integral part of society. And they are there to fill rosters so the minor league teams can stage games for their fans, not because the major league clubs require all those players to develop major league talent. Minor league baseball teams are also known as the farm teams, like I mentioned earlier. They're made up of players under the control of major league baseball from either signing them as a free agent or drafting them. Every major league team has a branching system of minor league teams that feed players up to the majors. Now, I had to update this presentation because recently there have been some changes to some of the biggest issues with minor league baseball. The MLB announced redesigning player development systems, which is something really important for the development of these athletes. They are planning to increase player salaries by 38 to 72 percent for the 2021 season, modernize facility standards better suited professional athletes, and affiliate teams will now be within 200 miles of their MLB team. This is important because a lot of minor league baseball athletes really don't get paid. They get their expenses taken care of. They get somewhere to stay. They get food and they get travel. And sometimes, depending on what, if they're in single A, double A, triple A, they'll get a small stipend. But it's really not a path for them to sustain a life on. Now, you can see here all the affiliate maps, the changes that we talked about, salary increases. Now, I want to go to the G League because this poses a threat to the NCAA. So in 2017, the G League changed. They established the Professional Pathways Program. It offers players a handsome six-figure salary to join the G League for a one-season stint where they have the opportunity to play against other G League foreign national and NBA academies across the world. Also in 2017, they rebranded from the D League, which was the developmental league, to the G League because it's now sponsored by Gatorade. And they wanted to denounce and erase the negative connotation of the G of the now G League that used to be the we're not quite good enough league connotation that followed the D League's inception in 2001. <clears throat> now this program provides opportunities off the court. The NCAA has partnered with Arizona State University in a nonprofit organization called Game Plan to offer scholarships to players for up to five years after their G League careers. All told, the program supports its participants athletically, academically, and financially, and it allows them to maximize their time before and during and after a potential stint in the NBA. It is specifically designed for elite athletes who'd like to develop their skills as professional basketball players before they are eligible for the NBA draft. The program is tailor-made for high school graduates opting not to play in college or play overseas. So when you look at this, can you see the correlation between the name image likeness topic we spoke about before and the changes that were made to the G League? The G League is offering an almost identical option to the NCAA, <clears throat> except you can profit off of your name, image, and likeness in that causes a scare to the NCAA. 
professional sports. Some of our main ones, as we know, NBA, NFL, MLS, PLL, the Professional Lacrosse League, something that's growing at a high rate, and then the MLB. Now, I really want to talk about the NBA. We talked about racial injustice and how it affects society in an earlier piece. I want to talk about the WNBA and what they are doing. The WNBA, WNBA has been in many ways more politically outspoken than the NBA. The WNBA though has moved as a league on the social justice front for years. Months before Colin Kaepernick took a knee, the Minnesota Lynx wore black shirts and had a press conference where they refused to talk about anything except for police brutality and the killing of Philando Castile. <clears throat> As a league, they hold community partnership days where they highlight social justice initiatives. Maya Moore, one of the budgeting stars of the WNBA from two years ago or so, took the season off to focus on criminal justice reform, <clears throat> particularly helping to get the case of Jonathan Irons dismissed and to get him released from prison, and she did. There is a clear pattern of commitment to social justice, politically racial justice from the NCAA. It's hard to generate the same level of interest, respect, and engagement with black women in sports or black women overall. It's just not in the realm of sports in which black women's labor and organizing goes overlooked for the man standing next to her. It is not just as one person, but as a league, and they've been the blueprint for some collective action that we are seeing. Now, let's talk about why the NBA is so gritty and why it's necessary. They catch so much hate because they're too black, too queer, and it's full of women. The NBA faces so much discrimination due to those three factors. They know how it feels and because of that, they fight. Why are they grittier? Because the players get paid a lot less, don't have the same kind of partnerships and don't have the same media exposure as their male counterparts. And that may be a reason why you didn't know that prior to Colin Kaepernick, the WNBA had been working on being politically outspoken in the community. Now, because the WNBA players have so much less, there is so much more on the line for these female players to protest and strike. So what's at stake for someone to sit out a game? What's at stake is that there are less games to lose. There's less sponsorships to lose. There's less salary to lose because they don't have as much of those things to start with. There's a smaller number of NBA teams, especially because of COVID, the NBA draft has been different and players drafted weren't able to get into their gyms to play before they were even cut from teams. There are so many talented people able to play at the WNBA level, but not enough infrastructure to support it. And that's why it's so important to see and to hear what the WNBA is doing for society and what they're trying to accomplish and improve. Now, let's talk about politicizing sports. What does that even mean? Celebrities have a high social status in our society, Dr. Chelsea Platt, assistant professor of sociology at Park University. Their social position allows celebrities to use their social status to enact social change. This could be another strategy used to promote a COVID vaccine. Good example, Patrick Mahomes. He was in the Super Bowl. He's one of the most recognizable celebrities in Kansas City. And in the past, he's used his status to encourage voting in transforming their stadium into a voting location and for the Black Lives Matter movement. Political opinions, let's talk about some numbers here. Only about one in four, 27% of all fans agree with, when I tune into sports, I wanna hear about political opinions. 37% overall, 
only 37% want to hear about social issues when tuning into sports. 18% see today's political and social issues as two different things. And 60% of fans do not agree that pro athletes should use their platforms to promote political issues. Now, the question I have to ask you, just because fans don't want to see it, does that mean the athletes shouldn't use their social status for change? Just like anyone else who has a platform to speak on, just because they're athletes, why does that give them less of a right? So as we get to the end of this presentation, I wanna revisit, because like I said at the beginning, I want you to formulate your own opinions. I wanna provide you with the information to help you formulate them, because just like I coach, I want to give you a model, and then I want you to take it and create your own successful way of understanding what we're talking about. So let's revisit today's emphasis. The power to create societal change can be seen as a, be a benefit or detriment. We talked about the racial injustices with the NCAA in professional sports, specifically the WNBA. How sports can empower the development of our future generations. We saw what they're doing in other countries where parents don't have to worry about spending money on their kids getting the opportunity to socialize and grow and improve themselves by using sport. But in the US, we're struggling with that. And you can see from the statistics that families making less are able to provide less opportunity to their children to have an opportunity in sport, while families with more are able to. That's a class, that's a Case system of low income versus high income, the haves versus the have nots. And then we learned about the insights on the debate over college athletes being paid to play. It's so much deeper than it seems. The name, image, and likeness is a part of it. And that's the piece that everyone sees. But as I talked about with seeing things through a different lens, you may not agree with them being paid to play or being able to use their own image, name, image, and likeness. But look through it from a different lens. Try to imagine what it's like to have all of this fame, to be on national TV, but not have money to send back to your parents or your siblings or your grandparents that you were taking care of before you came to college. Why would you wanna stay in there and keep playing when you have nothing to show them besides a college degree? which is great. But again, we have to look at things from a different level. Everyone has different priorities. The way that you're socialized and brought up affects those priorities. A lot of the time, it's not about you. It's not about them. It's not about us. Everyone looks at it differently. Everyone has different priorities. And I have some other useful resources and articles for people wanting to learn more. I can share this PowerPoint with Cameron if people would like to see it, but I just wanna thank everyone for coming on and listening to the presentation today. And I'm going to throw it back over to Cameron. Very good, thanks Daniel. Appreciate, uh, appreciate all your, uh, your insights, a lot of, lot, of, lot of great research there that you've, you've touched on. And, and if there are any questions, please um, either drop them in the chat or, or come off mute, but what I, one one thing from my um, perspective, Daniel, is you know this is all um, about application to practice, and I think you know there have been a bunch of bunch of questions that have come in prior to um, prior to your presentation um, that that really talk about what's you know what's the one takeaway that you would recommend that um, that that a not only sort of takes the conversation beyond just you know uh, uh, the value of what we do in sport, um, but but really, um, you know, trying to address some of the barriers that, that, that you've, you've mentioned here. And, and obviously, it's not a one size fits all. It's, it's quite a complicated context, you know, in, in the variety of settings that you've mentioned. But, you know, if there was one, 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 one piece to distill from, from everything you presented, what would, what would you say that that is? I think I would have to take that from my undergrad degree, which is, which is in sociology. And in sociology, they teach you that 
you will not always understand where everyone else is coming from, but you can deduct from understanding who they are, where they come from, what's important to them, and making sure that before you judge someone for the decision that they're making, try to look at it from another lens. Try to understand why are they making this decision and sometimes have some empathy you know, for, for what they may be going through because we just never know what's going on behind the scenes. And sport is such a great example of using that. Yeah, I think the the community building aspect of of what you're talking about is is you know has been emphasised very very dramatically, certainly since COVID has has changed the way we've we're, we're navigating, um, not not just sport but the world. And I think that that one element of of bringing, um, you know, it's a, a different ear, a different eye to the communities we live in. I think many sports, if you you know, you open the door and look at the community that's around the buildings that, that, that the sports are operating in. They very rarely reflect the the communities that they're, they're, they're in. Um, for, you know, from that end, you know, just taking it a, a step further. Um, you mentioned the NCAA and, and, and you know, the challenges of, of, of the um, <laughs> the future there. Where do you think it's going to go? What, do, what, what, do, what What's your sense of, where the NCAA is going to um, land um, in terms of you know the, the, the that large that large conversation of of treating athletes equitably. Yeah, I I think it's a great question, and you know in that slide, I found it so interesting to learn more about the NBA or the the G League, mm. that developmental league, because that league is a direct competitor of the NCAA and one of the NCAA's revenue generating sports. As we know, March Madness brings in so much money. I mean, just in the media rights deals alone, it's an incredible amount of money. So looking at that, I think it was this past year, the, I think it was the number one recruit or one of the top five recruits in the country coming out of high school decided to go to the G League. He decided to go there instead of going overseas or going to college. And I've seen a few other high level high school athletes that have decided to do that. And I think as much as the NCAA does struggle to pivot, I think they're going to have to pivot and they're going to have to allow something in the future. And I've seen some different models of what that means. Uh, Sometimes it's capping a certain amount, depending on the exposure that a student athlete has, you know, they, they implemented cost of attendance uh, when I was a student athlete. And that was a big deal for the revenue generating sports. They received, you know, a few thousand dollars, I think it was each year, each semester. And that was a big deal. But now we're coming up on something a lot bigger because you could leave the NCAA and go play abroad. You could go to the G League. You know, there's different options in football as well. So I I just believe the NCAA is gonna have to adapt and there's gonna be some sort of compensating athletes and the NCAA may be able to get away with creating a collective bargaining agreement uh, that includes, you know, future health care, um, you know, more resources for career development. And then, like we said, the collective bargaining agreement to help give some sort of funds to these student athletes. Yeah. Yeah, we live in the interesting times. I know it's it's been overused and overstated, but, um, but yeah, we, we I, I think all of us um that are drawn to this conversation are really trying to figure out how to innovate, how to be creative, because, you know, the, 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 the words of this is the way we've always done it. <laughs> they don't fly anymore because uh, yeah, so much has changed and so much is going to continue to, to, to be thrown at us. So that, that, that ability to create an environment where you are, be able, are, are able to innovate, are able to be creative and to be supported to do that, I think is, is, is definitely the, the, the message in between the lines of, of what you're talking about because, yeah, I think you, you put a very, very strong case here that, um, that there, there, there is incredible value in what we do, um, but, but it isn't a one-size-fits-all um, and we've got, to, we've got to think outside the box. So I'm mindful of everyone's time. Um, any, any final words, Daniel, and then we'll, we'll close it out? 
Sure. Um, I think uh, the two things, one is thank you for everyone that attended and for those that are going to watch the recording. And two, I think it's important, especially in conjunction with this program, as coaches and mentors and leaders in the college athletics realms, et cetera, or in professional sports, we're doing it for the athletes. In every decision we make, we need to think what is best for the athlete or the student and say, are we doing this for them? Is this helping them? Is this benefiting them right now in the present? How is this going to affect them in the future? And I think we really need to always have that in the back of our head when thinking of these different situations. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And uh, we've we've touched on that one. Um, you might have listened to some of the previous webinars that we've done. That that's definitely you know the athlete centered approaches is, is is definitely um, a theme that we'll we'll continue to come back to. So Daniel, uh, thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks for, thanks for sharing everything here. A lot, lot of great resources. Anyone wants to connect with um, Daniel, let me know, um, and we'll we'll share those those powerpoints for anyone that wants them. So uh, thanks again for everyone joining, and um, and we'll catch up with you next time. Thank you, Cameron.